The first question I have is, um, do I personally believe that female gendercide will ever end, given how deeply embedded it is in uh, Indian culture, given that Indian society almost believes that it has a God-given right? And my answer, I personally believe, that it has to stop, it will stop, and because I take it in a historical context. When we look at all other systems of systematic oppression of human groups in the past, including um, the slavery of Africans in the United States, um, apartheid in South Africa, uh, the way Europe colonized third world countries, all these were patriarchal systems that subjugated groups of people and used religion um, and, and, and uh, uh, the Bible as um, the, the reason and as a justification for perpetuating the system of oppression. But eventually, the, the groups of oppressed people uh, did unite, um, did rise against the system of oppression, and the system had to fall. And that is exactly what has to happen in India. Indian women across the board, regardless of caste, class, religion, etc., will have to unite and recognize they have a common cause and fight a system that is oppressive, fight a patriarchal system that is oppressive. And that will be the first time, the first step that we will take towards stopping female genocide. Um, the next question is why do people give birth to an infant and then kill it. Why don't they give it up for adoption? Why don't they give a baby girl up for adoption? And the thing is you can ask the same question for any other kind of killing. For example, dowry matters. Uh, once the, the cash well dries up, when you cannot extract another car or a flat or five kgs of gold from the bride's parents, then why kill her? You can divorce, you can separate and say, I'm going to get another bride uh, from whom I shall extract more money. If, if that is what you really want, more money. But what gives you the right to kill her? What makes you think you have the right to kill her? The same thing with so-called honor killings. If you do not like uh, a, 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 a girl in your community or a woman marrying a man from another community, excommunicate them, say we don't want to deal with you, but what gives you the right to think you can kill her? And that is because, as in the previous question it was pointed out, Indian society thinks of girls and women as personal property. It is like you own um, a, a piece of furniture. If I don't want the furniture, if it does not serve my need anymore, I can dump it in, in the rubbish uh, heap. I can hack it uh, to pieces, I can burn it down, and they do the same thing. Women and girls are actually treated like pieces of non-human property. So that is the answer that you have, why we don't do, why, why they don't give uh, their baby girl up for adoption. There are parents who do, and they obviously are having an inner conflict about it, and at some level they recognize this is a human being. <clears throat> what <clears throat> is the use of advocating um, rights for uh, girl children when those rights cannot even be guaranteed to them, when laws cannot be properly enforced, um, and how can such barriers be removed? Uh, the, the thing is, with all systems, um, it always, uh, it, it concerns me when I hear women saying, uh, women in India saying laws cannot be enforced. Uh, because when you look at the civil rights movement in the United States, for example, to stop the lynching of, of black men uh, to, to, or violence against black people and desegregation uh, to uh, eliminate uh, in-your-face discrimination, 
the civil rights activists, their focus, their primary focus was on making the system accountable. Laws have to be enforced because till those boundaries are drawn, you're not going to stop the immediate impact um, of violence on the subjugated group. Um, and uh, you would never hear uh, people in, perhaps earlier, earlier, uh, it took a very long time, even in South Africa, even in um, the United States, for uh, the, the suppressed, oppressed communities as a whole to rise up, because I think there was, uh, be, communities get depressed. So for me, that is, when women say laws cannot be enforced as a rationalization, that concerns me because you would not hear other people, uh, for example, uh, black people uh, in the United States saying, well, what's the use? Yes, we will get killed because we are black, because laws cannot be enforced. That, that is a sort of a hopelessness. And it is very important, that is why, for women to recognize that, that you cannot, it is you who cannot be giving the rope to the system. You're giving the leeway to the system when you say laws cannot. What you should be asking, what all of us should be asking is why can laws not be uh, enforced? I demand that laws be enforced and make the government and make the system accountable. And, and that is what we have to do. What role do women in a family play in perpetuating violence? like for example in the killing of infant girls or um, in uh, dowry violence and murders. And why is it that women participate this way? Well, you answered half that question yourself, yes. And I've heard it said many times by women, oh, it's not the patriarchy, it is not men who are doing it, it is women who are inflicting violence on themselves. Why do women inflict? this violence on, on each other. Well, in any system that becomes closed and hopeless, within the oppressed group, there emerges competition for survival. And I want to show you this book. Uh, there is a place on earth by Juliana Tedeschi. She was a survivor in a Nazi concentration camp. And this is a very powerful but painful account of what it was like to live with other women in, in this camp and what it came to write in, and in the end of this book she talks about how women who would ordinarily be friends, they begin to respond to each other with this kind of animal-like competition a, 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 a kind of um, barbarism which comes into you when you want survival. So uh, all the women would try to find some advantage by either uh, pandering to the Nazis, they were the oppressors. For example, uh, she talks about how women um, who were the prostitutes for the Nazi, who agreed uh, to let them use them as, as sex slaves. They got more food uh, compared to the other women who, was, who literally starved to death or else they would become so thin, they would fall ill and die or they would become so thin that uh, they could not use them anymore in uh, the labor camps. So then they would send them uh, to the uh, crematoriums to be burnt. And she talks about that, that when women are put in this, in this system, this closed prison system where there's no air, no light, no room to breathe, and they are forced to compete for survival, then pandering to uh, the, the, the lords and masters actually gives them an edge of survival. And that is what we are seeing. In, in, um, in the system here, when women, when women start killing other women or girls, what we are seeing in India is a concentration camp response in the women. 
it is an indication of how bad the situation is. The, this next question is, is interesting. It says that don't you think that industrialization and urbanization um, contribute to female feticide and female gender side and are there links between these processes? And yes, there are. There, this actually, in, it happens, there are two ways that the, the, the link is there. One is the direct link. And that is um, something that we don't talk about, but we absolutely must start talking about, that the rate of uh, the, the child sex ratios for girls is uh, closest to normal in the poorest 20% of the population. But as um, the sections of society in India get more educated, they uh, have higher incomes and obviously they have more access to technology, the child sex ratio drops. And this is what the 2011 census clearly shows that it gets worse for the middle class, but it is worse, the child sex ratio is worse for the topmost 20% of the population. And the other thing that you ask about um, is uh, how else does it contribute? Uh, well, the, the thing is, any time there is a system of, of killing, there is there are newer technologies being developed, for example, in the United States um, to, for, um, uh, to make sex selection easier, to make it more affordable, to make it more reachable. So uh, capitalist systems, which are also patriarchal systems, see this as opportunism. You know, and there's a parallel with, for example, the Jewish genocide. Um, the United States was trading in arms and ammunition with Germany right up to the, the right up to World War II. They were selling uh, landmines and, and other forms of ammunition, which the Germans used against American soldiers eventually. Um, so yes, uh, cap patriarchal systems. Uh, there's one patriarchal system that is. Um, that as you go up, that ha where as you get into the middle and upper classes, the, the power increases. And so what you see, the drop in child sex ratio, is the, the more powerful sections of the, the uh, patriarchal system exercising their, their power with, with more force, with more vengeance, and other associated patriarchal systems uh, joining in, benefiting from it. Um, again, this is uh, along uh, the, 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 the same line it says that is it uh, necessarily poverty um, or family lineage or overpopulation that results in uh, the, the crime of uh, female genocide or is it simply a mentality? And it is, uh, well, mentality is, a, I think, an overused word. We should say what it is, and this is misogyny, just like there was anti-Semiticism in um, Europe. It is a sustained and targeted discrimination against a group that creates a, a permissiveness that allows that, that where the society gives itself permission to target that group. And like I said before, it is not poverty. It is not the poorest sections that have the, the uh, highest rates. Even, for example, in, in Chennai where uh, a neighborhood uh, surveys were done, they found that, that as the wealth of neighborhoods increased, dowry-related violence and dowry-related murders also increased. The same thing, for example, with um, other areas where you've never had um, 
uh, dowry, for example, a Sam. A Sam traditionally never had the practice of dowry or dowry violence or dowry murders, or for that matter, female feticide or infanticide. However, as wealth has increased in a Sam, there has been a corresponding increase in those particular strata of dowry related violence and dowry related murders. So it is always um, uh, uh, the, 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 it, it is an exercise of power, it's an exercise of patriarchal power and since wealth and education uh, gives more power to a patriarchal strata, it is those, those stratas that are educated, that are wealthier, that also have more power to perpetuate female genocide. This is a very important question, number 10. Um, it says, talking about abortion rights and the question of choice, is female fetal abortion in India really a choice? And um, this, the, the, the reason this is a very important question uh, to address is because, of, and I, I, I'm speaking for, about this personally, when I first went to the United States and I came across um, the anti-abortion lobby and what a big issue it was, I was surprised. Uh, why would abortion be such a big issue here? Um, and as I talked to, to women, uh, the pro-choice women and other feminist women, there was something I uh, realized which I actually had never heard growing up in India, that it wasn't actually about abortion. It was about a woman's complete autonomy and right over her body, her sexuality, her sex, her reproduction. Her body is her territory. Nobody has any right over it. So it is not a question of um, uh, uh, whether uh, just whether or not a woman has abortion, even if there was a pregnancy forced on a woman, if um, she was forced to carry uh, a pregnancy to full term, that is a violation of of choice. If she wants to have an abortion and she's not um, permitted, uh, she's prevented by. Uh, her husband or family members or society at large, that is a violation of her body. And that is a concept in India that we never deal with. We are actually raised to believe that the family um, that we are born to and then the family that marries, uh, that a, a, a woman, where when she marries a man, that the family that the man is from, owns her body. So for example, um, the number of times I have heard women, friends, who, uh, Indian w women, who uh, are say at, at a peak of their career, they've got married, there's a promotion in the wings or, or some project that is really important to them and they happen to get pregnant. Maybe, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, birth control pill failed or um, you know there can be accidents but she does not want to have the baby at that point in time next thing you know the husband the in-laws everybody starts pressurizing her oh no you cannot have an abortion this is our child and she's put under so much mental trauma that she's just not permitted that is a violation of choice. In the end, a woman's reproduction, her body, it's, it is a biological function. When you begin to control it, all the abortions, the, the female fetal uh, abortions, I have never heard a woman say, well, I want to have a son and I don't want to have daughters and her husband and uh, in-laws are saying no 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 but we want to have a girl you cannot abort this girl because we really want a girl the the, the everything is so preset you know the the uh, the 
the pressure is so um, intense on women uh, that it does not that there are women whose personalities are such that psychologically they just give up right at the start where they say you cannot you will not but there are many cases and over and over I've heard these cases more where women are when they don't want to have the abortion they are starved and the, this is middle class upper middle class homes very often repeatedly you hear the story that my husband suddenly kicked me off the bed in the middle of the night or pushed me down the stairs to to in to force an abortion she will have an accident and she will have an abortion and the thing is you hear of systematic torture and abuse and this is another thing that Juliana Tedeschi talks about in this book where she says she's she says how the Nazis took control over the, the reproductive, uh, over the body. She says something so personal. Women were forced to undergo abortions. Women were forced to undergo sterilizations. And she talks about how invaded she feels. Something that is so personal, your body, your reproduction. Um, how can somebody come in and take control of that? And there were parallels, very strong, powerful parallels between the, the paragraphs where she describes about how they do that to the stories that I hear from, from Indian women. In the end, even when you hear of torture camps like the Nazi concentration camps, the control of biological functions, you know, it's sleep, food, you know, uh, prevention of defecation, prevention of sleep, these are all bodily functions. When, um, or, or rape, or forced sterilizations, or forced abortions, these are all methods used of torture when people are in torture, kept in, women are kept in torture camps, or, or men are kept, the control, uh, the violent control of bodily function. And that is what we need to understand about choice in India. What we are seeing in India, whether it is where women are forced to have children, uh, we never discuss that. And <clears throat> those are the other stories where if you go into slums and villages, women say they, they are tired of having children, but if they try to uh, get you know, uh, go for birth control or get the tubes tied, they get beaten up. Um, two years ago, I met this woman who was working for a friend of mine whose husband, when she went to one of these camps and secretly got herself sterilized because she was, so her body was broken down of having child after child and her husband beat her up so badly he used a, a, a red um, uh, stick from from the stove and she was burnt all over her hands and you hear these kind of stories on both sides women being forced to have children women being forced to have abortions and it is a form of systematic torture and control of women's bodies um, this uh, other question this question I'm a little unclear on but um, what this person says is that in India, when, when girls are growing up, sometimes they like to dress and behave like boys and they are called uh, tomboys. And as they grow older, their parents or society try to uh, force them to fit the female uh, uh, gender role. That is, does this, can this aspect be explained in terms of gender side? Now, I am not very clear on this question, but I'm going to interpret it in two ways. One is that when, uh, uh, since uh, gender is not really, uh, they're not really clothes, but um, they are, um, uh, it's not just clothes, but it is also the kind of uh, behavior, uh, approach to life, to society that a person takes, where men uh, are encouraged to uh, be adventurous, to take risks, uh, to, to discover the limits of their own, you know, strengths and abilities. Well, women are not, they are contained in, in, in more defined roles. And if that is what you mean, that uh, 
where a woman's self-confidence, her abilities, her sense of power are contained uh, in terms of gendercide, yes, it, it could it could be because gendercide stems from a, 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 a patriarchal thinking that has to separate male and female uh, and create a system for the use of male where uh, females are um, the objects for the use. So yes, that could be one way of interpreting it. The other one, and I wasn't sure if this is what she meant, uh, is that are they concerned that uh, that this that the, the that some of some women who may be gay that they are forced um, that their sexuality sexual orientations are curbed because uh, uh, that that it would not be acceptable to the system. Now it is odd that you mentioned genocide because in Amritsar uh, a few years ago there was a case of two lesbian women who fell in love and got married and the families filed police cases against them and then the police actually arrested them and took them to the uh, to police station and when the judge asked why the police said that they said we have such few women to marry in Punjab now women start marrying each other what are men supposed to do so yes I suppose whether it's talking about women asserting themselves or developing confidence and their place in society or their sexual orientation it always boils down to how the patriarchal system needs to uh, contain women as objects through their roles through rules for the use of men. So um, I think in both, uh, you know, that those are two interpretations of that question. Um, this question number 12 says that there are so many explanations given for skewed sex ratios. Uh, how do, how can we start, and they, they seem to be coming from a whole lot of different places, so how do we place and deal with this systematic uh, extermination when it seems like there are multiple causes? Well, in any system of systematic gendercide, they don't, there is not one identified causes. For example, the Jewish genocide, women were forced to, uh, they were forcefully sterilized, their babies were killed, uh, they were starved to death. The parallels, just listen to the parallels with how women are being killed in India. Uh, they, they were burnt uh, if they were, or they, 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 they felt they couldn't extract any more cash from them by using their labor, they were killed. Um, they, many were shot to death. So when there is a system of genocide, it is there is no one particular way it's whatever way the idea is if you're female you know you're marked for death so uh, we will use you the best we can and if when we think you're of no use to us then we will kill you and that is exactly what we need we need to recognize this as the genocide of a targeted group and you have we have to target every single thing every single thing and to do that we have to target the system because you cannot have a genocide uh, without um, the permission of the system and it is only permissiveness of a system that allows the gen genocide to continue so uh, it is the system that has to to answer and be accountable the minute we recognize this as a genocide and recognize this as a genocide under international laws I do believe that the, uh, the, the, the machinery will fall into place. Um, this other question is that uh, how can we trace our target group because uh, there, it seems like that there is no specific criteria of education, economics, uh, clan, class. It is true, it is happening in all strata, it is happening uh, across all groups now, in all states now. But the census data very clearly shows a pattern. And that is, as you grow, go towards the middle and upper classes, the rate of female gendercide 
gets worse, it is worst for the topmost. So this is the question that we need to ask. Why are we not addressing the data that the census is showing? Why is it that all, all the NGOs and all the groups that work, they begin to focus on the poorer communities, thereby using poverty and illiteracy as a justification because it is not. We know it is not true. We know it is not poverty. We know it is not illiteracy. And I'll tell you why. Because most female activists in India, or male activists, um, they come from the middle and upper classes. We have grown up witnessing this violence, but we are actually conditioned in the middle and upper classes to be more silent. In um, Just ask yourself, why is it that the media goes running to the slum and the, and the village where a woman says, my baby has been killed, or um, uh, you know, a bride is uh, burnt to death or, or killed in, in some particular way by, by hanging, and that is because People in slums and villages talk. They, they, when something happens, they are more open about it. Middle and upper class women, starting from childhood, they are conditioned by their mothers and grandmothers and aunts and women around them to shut up, to keep quiet, to, to actually hide it, you know, to protect the family name. And part of it could be that in the lower classes, in the poorer classes, this idea of um, oppression by hierarchy is already there because of um, wealth, because of caste, and so the 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 idea when I talk when I if I talk to women from slums and villages that about male oppression that this kind of violence is through male oppression men think themselves that they have the right. To, to kill and that's why they kill and they'll say yes men think they have the right to do anything but if you talk to middle and upper class women it is astonishing how they will always have a roundabout way of explaining it they will start with well all men are not like that yes I know all men are not like that but we are talking about a system here you know and that system dominantly composed of males are doing this and um, I think that because middle and upper class women have not confronted uh, the violence that we have seen, forced abortions, you know, or um, unexplained death, there is a Miss India or a Miss Universe whose father um, tried to uh, suffocate her to death. Now, if she had died, I can guarantee you, no one would have ever known about it. it deaths in of whether of girls or uh, women for dowry etc they are always they you know they, they are covered by their their the, the family sort of closes ranks and covers it up they will bribe the police uh, they will pull all their contacts and they will hush it up so i think that uh, we are talking about a target group we already have a target group and uh, the census data very clearly shows the pattern that it increases as you go towards the middle classes and it's worst for the uppermost classes and this is the question we start to uh, we need to start asking NGOs government uh, efforts and groups that why are you not addressing the target groups why are you not addressing the target groups do I think that increasing the severity of the punishment uh, will uh, stop uh, uh, female infanticide and dowry murders. Most, well, or whether we take female infanticide or dowry murders or um, uh, honor killings, the law almost is never implemented. And that's because they have political patronage. Me politicians and government realize it is a system uh, of men, for men, by men. And even when we have women, as indeed we do, top uh, political leaders, 
they realize that too. So for example, I'm always interested, for example, Sonia Gandhi, I watch her face very closely when she's in political rallies, uh, when she's speaking how to, to villages, how because of caste they have been oppressed or poverty. Her face is impassioned, there's energy, there's anger on her face. And yet, uh, it took her, it took goading when the Delhi bus gang rape, um, uh, young, the, the, the young woman was, was raped, she had to be goaded into speaking and when she spoke there was none of that passion none of that anger you know and the women female politicians that we have today understand that they are there to serve the men it is a system for men and um till women change that i know that there is an argument for the 33 percent but this is exactly what we are going to see we are going to see women of patriarchal families taking the, 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 the positions to serve, to continue serving men. And then when the female gender side continues, they'll say, oh, look, you've already got 33% women, but see, nothing is happening. I, I think the only time 33% women will be effective is when women in India develop a collective political presence, a, poli poli a, a, a voter's presence, and we make a demand as as, as a group, um, the, the women politicians in Western countries, they are first accountable to the female voters. You know, that, that is a vote bank that is unforgiving. It, that will be unforgiving if a female political leader was to make a, a, a decision that was, uh, was not that that was going to contribute in some way to the suppression oppression of women or for example if something horrendous happened like this and she did not instantly and angrily speak out um what message uh, this woman says that uh, and this is the last question and it's a very sad question she says what do i symbolize to my society and um, isn't it a better option not to be born at all? And I think that that is a terrible, that is, um, there were women in uh, the um, Nazi concentration camps who would say that to each other. Um, they committed, there were women who committed suicide. Um, and it is a statement of terrible hopelessness. Um, I do not think that that is a question you must ever ask India. If you are a girl or a woman today, do not ask India what they represent to you. Do not tell India, do not give incentives like, see, I'm a mother, I give birth for you. If you let me live, I will contribute to the economic development of India. I can be half the workforce. But the thing is, women are already doing a lot of work. They're already contributing a lot and it does not matter. It really does not matter even if you're not. Even if you never give birth, it doesn't mean that anyone has the right to kill you. Even if you're poor, nobody has the right to kill you. Even if you don't have a job, nobody has the right to hurt you, harm you, or kill you. As a human being, your first right is to safety. To You have the right to live as a girl or a woman. I never have to tell a male-dominated society, please don't kill me because I can be of use to you. I must never ever justify my existence that way. That is my right under the Constitution. That is my right as a, a, a citizen of the world, as a human being. It's my global human right. It is my right under the Indian Constitution. So as a girl, as a woman, I would urge you, do not ask India, do not ask the Indian society what you represent it to them decide that for yourself when you want a sense of worth look within find seek what you the, the answers that you want within don't look to a, a horribly misogynistic society for assurance on what your worth is that sense of worth i hope i i urge you to find within yourself and then assert yourself 
all of us women in India, we have to, it, it doesn't, we have to, to unify across um, the board, regardless of caste, class, uh, you know, race, um, economics, and recognize that this is a patriarchal system that is oppressing women across the board. Until we are able to do that, we are not going to take, we, are, we haven't even taken the first step towards stopping female gender side. The, and we will have taken that step when uh, female leaders uh, begin to fire politicians, uh, they clean out all politicians with rape records, records of sexual harassment, molestation, rape, murder, uh, dowry related crimes and other crimes against women and they say these are people that we will not tolerate in our parties. That means, that means the voice of, of the, the Indian woman, the Indian woman has finally been heard, that the Indian woman has finally claimed her stake in this country and is saying, I count and you better listen.